Many residents of Southampton recall striking up friendships with the American troops during World War II. Southampton was the principal embarkation base for American forces before D-Day. In the run-up to D-Day, roads in Shirley, Bitten, as well as central Southampton, were blocked with queuing tanks and jeeps. A common story is that these soldiers were invited to bed down in people's living rooms and front doors were left open for them. A Shirley resident remembers English and American soldiers being camped outside his house. We used to leave the door open at night so they could come in and sleep on the floor in the sitting room instead of sleeping in a tank. However, there were also incidents of racial tension between American soldiers. Black and white soldiers did not serve in the same units. The US base for white troops was in Hoglands Park, whilst the black soldiers provided mainly logistical support from barracks in the old Ordnance Survey buildings where the new law courts now stand in London Road. Black soldiers were expected to unload lorries at Southampton docks, but only white soldiers can be seen aboard the ships going to fight in the war. Even black and white soldiers' social lives were segregated. A chapel since demolished, also in London Road, served as a social club for black soldiers. It was still very controversial for a black American and a white woman to be seen together and this was a flashpoint for trouble in some cases. During the American stay there were 27 cases of racially motivated violence recorded in Southampton. The tension did not go unnoticed by local residents. Brenda can recall putting on shows in Southampton sometimes involving top flight stars. Only if you have experienced these shows can you know what they meant to us, she says. One item, though, I remember the shock of seeing how the black and white American troops were segregated. They had a different night out in the town, and the fights were inevitable. For a black soldier to be with a white girl was enough reason for a full-scale riot. Things have altered so very much, it is unthinkable now. It was very real then. Carol Ann also tells a first-hand account of seeing segregation in Southampton. My life in the country is just one long memory of the fun we had with all the Allied troops living in camps in the surrounding woods. My favourites were the Americans who showered us children with sweets and comics, took us on wild rides in their jeeps and into their camps to show us movies and give us parties that I will never forget. We had Canadians, Australians and New Zealanders in camps and convoys of lorries and tags in every lane and on the walk to school. Black Americans were camped separately and did not mix with the civilians outside their camp but in the evenings many families would walk over to hear them sing gospel and folk songs as they sat around campfires. Of course such stories are not confined to Southampton. Edith Haynes worked in an American Red Cross club in Liverpool between 1942 and the end of 1944. She was a professional singer and worked with black soldiers and formed a male voice choir which sang in many settings in the UK, including a choral concert on the steps of St George's Hall, Liverpool, which was taped and sent to Washington. She loved the work, but was very distressed by the racism within the American army. The soldiers she worked with had white officers who patronised them, and so she wrote a letter of complaint to General Eisenhower about the segregation of soldiers. In September 1943, the Daily Express, who had recently run an anti-segregation and anti-colour bar campaign, put on a show at the Royal Albert Hall that was on behalf of the visiting coloured American troops. At the beginning of the evening, and to the sound of rolling drums, a single file of 200 black soldiers from a segregated division of the American Air Force's engineers marched onto the stage. The nervous soldiers were joined on stage by Roland Hayes, the renowned black lyric tenor who had travelled to England specifically for the occasion. Roland Hayes and the Negro Chorus were at the prestigious venue for the debut of an orchestral work called Morning Freedom, set to traditional Negro spirituals and songs to highlight their plight by its white composer Corporal Mark Blitzstein. By the end of World War II, there were many black officers, a black infantry division, a black cavalry division, as well as the now legendary Tusky Airmen. In late 1944 and into 1945, in several divisions, rifle companies received a platoon of black soldiers 
that served side by side with white soldiers in what had been white units up to that point. On July the 26, 1948, President Truman signed Executive Order 9981, which states, It is hereby declared to be the policy of the President that there shall be equality of treatment and opportunity for all persons in the armed services without regard to race, colour, religion or national origin. Although this cannot stop racial prejudice, it shows how the experience of the war contributed to changing attitudes not just in the United States.